belligerent Stalin addresses a closed party session in October 1925. He declares war on Russia's farmers. The Kulaks are traditional enemies of central authority. He lashes out. Kulaks are the stronghold of counter-revolution. Rise up in arms against the Kulaks. Liquidate the Kulak class. A little over 50 years ago, the Club of Rome published the Limits of Growth report. And it came to a drastic conclusion. Stop economic and population growth, or else our planet will not cope. The Netherlands is one of many nations that's been taking measures to reduce its nitrogen pollution and a number of farms may have to be closed down. In order to restore nature we have to reduce the number of animals in the Netherlands. It's basically the second largest food exporter in the world and they're being told that they're going to need to cut their production at a time of global food insecurity to basically uh, follow climate mandates. This seems like complete insanity to me. Part of the Dutch plan is to buy out farms which are uh, being seen as being uh, pollutant. The minister talking about hugely attractive buyout packages, that's a ridiculous statement. The government should force farmers to stop, it has to happen now and it will be painful. Farmers have to be told, you will need to quit and we will withdraw your license. We will compensate you, but you have to stop. Lots of questions about their future, so they want some answers from the government. What will happen to us? Environmental groups have said more reductions, more cattle has to disappear. They are using the narrative of nitrogen to, to get rid of us. But um, actually we're doing a very important part. We're feeding the Netherlands. We're feeding a big part of Europe. So the population is rising. So consu consumption is rising. But we want to cut production. This is very unlogical. They're taking away the security. And of course they have all these ideas about where we could get our food from in the future. But this is not at all a reassuring. What if people just were encouraged to eat less meat or to, you know, eat less dairy? Bill Gates and big names in Hollywood are pushing to eat bugs as a way to prevent climate change. Bugs are high in protein and could replace the high intake of beef, chicken and pork. Critics against eating meat say raising these animals is adding to pollution. And as the world tries to cut back on pollutants to save the planet, people's source of food could be affected. The intention sounds so great. Everybody wants to save the planet, save the earth. Great, great, great. It's just like praise, praise God. Praising God is always great. But if you look at the consequence, it just means you make everything so much expensive that you create uh, abject poverty for you uh, destroy the, the middle class. You make the lower class even poorer and you only have a small elite in their networks. You had a member of the Bank of England who openly said in an interview, well, we have to make peace with the fact that we will be poorer in the future. Now, that's easy for him to say, but if we look at the history of revolutions, uh, both ancient ones and more modern ones, this is how it starts. People do not accept forever that they're simply going to get poorer, poorer and poorer and that their children will be worse off than they were. At some point, that anger will turn against the political system. Greenpeace says compensating farmers on a voluntary basis won't lead to a big enough reduction in nitrogen. Ministers and mensen van grote natuurorganisaties, zoals Greenpeace, de Vogelbescherming en Natuurmonumenten, gaan er praten over de stikstofplannen. Het probleem wordt alleen maar erger, dus je moet gewoon nu beginnen. Boze boeren die op verschillende plaatsen in het land protesteren. De boeren voeren ook vandaag weer actie. Op dit moment wordt de brug op de N233... De manier is in de Netherlands, which is ammonia, which is een vorm van uh, nitrogen, which is bad for the environment, bad for nature. And they have declared that nitrogen is the major problem. Well, I'm an expert in nitrogen, and I dare to say it is not. <laughs> We're basically going through 
the new technological revolution, aren't we? And under the guise of climate change. So they're being told, change this and that, make it more environmentally friendly, you're destroying the land. But actually, it's just more corporatism um, and it's taking away the national identity, I think, of so many people around the world, especially in this case, the farmers. Come down! Come down! Come down! Come on! 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 Everybody who thinks of Holland, it's windmills, it's clogs, it's milk, it's cheese. Our country is based on agriculture. We are famous for uh, walking on wooden shoes, on clogs. <laughs> and we, uh, we are also very famous for our cheese and milk production. We have around, I think it's 60,000 farmers in the Netherlands. Everyone, even if you live in the city, uh, like in Amsterdam or in Rotterdam, after a five minute drive, you will see cows, you will see farmland. I mean, it's so ingrained in our, in our society, in our way of life, that farmers are part of our culture. Everyone has someone in their family who was once a farmer. This is my dad. Uh, my dad did uh, uh, buy uh, uh, the farm from his father. So uh, his father started in the very early uh, of uh, the, the last century. After, um, uh, for 30 or 40 years the farm, I did buy the farm from my dad. And uh, now I'm the farmer on this farm. The government has taken the stand that we do have a huge problem with nature and that due to EU regulations, we should save nature. And now they want to solve that problem by simply eliminating a large amount of farms. The major uh, thing that kicked our movement was when um, uh, Thierry de Groot, one of the leaders of uh, the uh, D66, D66, uh, came up with uh, the idea to shout out loud in the media that the best plan for the Netherlands was to cut half of the animals. So he wants uh, to get rid of half of the livestock of the Netherlands. We are the second uh, biggest party of the, of the Netherlands. And um, uh, we uh, really have negotiated with other more conservative parties on a new chapter in the Dutch agricultural policy. They said in 2019, they said um, publicly that they want to get rid of half of the farmers, half of the animals and half of the farmers. When this uh, injustice is put over the Dutch farmers, a lot of people stood up. Thousands of Dutch farmers are rallying against the government on their tractors. They are uh, publicly talking about cutting down half of the farms in the Netherlands because it would be good for nature. But this is total bullshit. It's, it's a crock of shit. It's, it's bogus. It's, 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 a false, uh, it's a false ideology. Now the goal is to, in order to restore nature, uh -huh. to cut nitrogen with 50% uh, in 2030. And this is, a huge, this is huge for farmers, of course. From 28,000 uh, animal farmers, they want uh, 11,000 farms close, and another uh, 8 to 10,000 farms should reduce their production. The effects of this nitrogen policy is, is, is devastating. We, I mean, there's just no other way to look at it, I think. It has been put forward so rapidly, farmers had to, to immediately uh, 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 comply to these, these, these crazy, um, impossible demands, really. Uh, and those demands have resulted in them having to give up their, their farms. Why I need to go my cows? Why my farm need to close? Our intention is to explain why this is so important for them and for nature. Mm -hmm. but not to change the goals of the policy. That's not the case. It's not going to happen. If nitrogen is most of the air we breathe, then how can nitrogen be pollution? It's not like a toxic chemical 
that we should <laughs> that we should eradicate. And nitrogen is a completely natural compound in nature. Without nitrogen, we would not be there. Nitrogen is also necessary for things to grow. These are the three macronutrients that are essential for plant growth. Nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Nitrogen gets top billing because it's responsible for keeping plants green, which is why fertilizers for grass tend to have a high N factor. Nitrogen management is uh, an integral part of environmental policies in quite a lot of countries. Political agreements since 1990 has substantially reduced nitrogen oxide emissions from the European part of our region. Local nitrogen pollution hotspots will require a cap. They'll actually require a reduction below the current level. Wat kan stikstof voor schade aanrichten? Wat kan stikstof voor schade aanrichten? Die stikstof verrijkt de bodem en dat heeft als gevolg dat planten die weinig stikstof nodig hebben verdrongen worden door planten die juist heel hard groeien door stikstof. Denk bijvoorbeeld aan de orchidee die overwoekerd wordt door de brandnetel. Die stikstof verrijkt de bodem en dat heeft als gevolg dat planten die weinig stikstof nodig hebben verdrongen worden door planten die juist heel hard groeien door stikstof. Denk bijvoorbeeld aan de orchidee die overwoekerd wordt door de brandnetel. The nitrogen is only a problem for a few plants. And there are certain plants that don't like it and they disappear. Other plants like it and they appear. So basically what you're doing is changing nature. Doordat sommige planten hier extra goed door groeien. Zij overwoekeren de kwetsbaardere, zeldzame planten. De natuur heeft onder andere last van de neerslag van stikstof. Doordat sommige planten hier extra goed door groeien. Zij overwoekeren de kwetsbaardere, zeldzame planten. Wanneer is iets natuur? Uh, en is niet... Als het met een grote mate van vrijheid zelf kan groeien. Ja. But instead of prolonging these debates, I want today to concentrate on one point. And that is the clear message that a growth model centered on fossil fuels is simply obsolete. We are governed by incompetent people, but we have to face the fact that in the past, previous generations made us so rich that we could afford to be stupid, but gradually we are no longer that rich to, to afford to be that stupid. Yeah, if we look at the Netherlands, uh, livestock is actually the biggest source. It's responsible for uh, yeah, about 65% of all the emissions that uh, precipitate on uh, our protected natural areas. A couple of hundred years ago, we, we chopped all our trees and what was left was sand dunes. In Holland, we are a densely populated uh, country and we don't have nature. We've got a big garden. In Europe, we have uh, the special protection, protected uh, areas, which uh, we call Nature 2000. They were selected uh, uh, according to the special uh, species or habitats we were uh, there. Natura 2000 is the largest network of protected areas in the world. In het pas zijn alle beschermde natuurgebieden, de Natura 2000 gebieden, opgenomen waar organismen leven die last hebben van overbelasting door stikstof. Dat geldt voor 118 van de 160 Natura 2000 gebieden. You have to go back maybe 25 years when some silly civil servants went to the European Union and they said, um, well, we've got nature, but our nature, we call them sand dunes. And if you have nitrogen oxide deposits on sand dunes, eventually you will, you will end up with a forest, which I think is not bad, but we promised the EU it will stay sand dunes. So we will maintain it like that. We had a lot of problems with uh, nitrogen uh, rules because our farm is near to and in Nature 2000. And that is, uh, uh, that is really a problem for, uh, for us. This is my land, I'm, I'm owner, but this is also uh, uh, nature land, nature 2000. In this area, 
the government say we need to reduce 95% of the uh, nitrogen uh, who's coming out of the stables. The government is picking on the farmers much too much. That is absolutely not necessary to save nature. Thousands of Kulak families are rousted from their homes. Their land, grain, implements and livestock plundered. After the war, they start to build up agriculture, they start pushing agriculture to produce more. First it was a good thing because they gave money to grow bigger and better, um, but now they're using the money to control us. For example, I can't choose the crop that I want to grow. I need to change my crops accordingly to the plan of the government. And they have no clue what they're doing. The 15th of May of every year, the Dutch farmers, they have to give up uh, how many cattle they have, how many, uh, uh, fields they have, what they grow in the fields, when they harvest, how they harvest. They have to tell uh, which kind of cows they have. They have to tell uh, how much cows they want to have in the nearby future, how many calves were born, how many of them are male, how many of them are female. Yes, it's as crazy as that. It's never ending. They want to know everything. So you have to test the manure? You have to test the manure, yes. Every time? Every time, every time. Every time we have to test the manure, if, what, what, how much phosphorus is in it, how much ammonia is in it. So that's crazy. You can't take manure to your neighbor's farm? No. Without the laboratory test? That's correct. That's correct. And since how long have they been doing that? Uh, well, that is all, that, that's, that's for probably 20 years now. It's so complicated. Uh, it's not any more possible for me as a farmer to report them. We have to put it by an uh, administration. Uh, who have to do it for us and uh, well that is about somewhere between five or ten thousand euros a year costs which uh, well, we we don't get nothing back for it it's no use it's only more costs and uh, less less income for for me as a farmer in the search for contraband every home is ransacked the scavengers miss nothing Every last kernel is gleaned and carted off. Um, and this is what they're using to, to, to uh, provide as a narrative for, the, for what they're doing. But actually our Ministry of uh, Nitrogen, yes, we really have a Minister of Nitrogen in the Netherlands. <laughs> it's funny, but we have. Yeah, we have now recently a Ministry of Nitrogen. <laughs> <laughs> You're laughing. Uh, this is the first time in history that we actually have a Minister of Nitrogen. But she doesn't have a clue about nitrogen. She doesn't have any education on nitrogen. She's not a chemist. She just has a mission that we should have 50% uh, nitrogen uh, reduction. Why? She doesn't know. I asked her in the, in the house and she doesn't have a clue. Which is funny in itself if it, if it wasn't for the fact that people's lives depend on it. Farmers' lives depend on it. The role of the Rabobank is, is really weird because the Rabobank was the, the farmer's bank. They used to support uh, and finance the farmers. This bank um, uh, apologized for loaning money to farmers. So a, farming, uh, a bank raised by farmers to loan money to farmers put excuses for loaning money to farmers. So that's ridiculous. But a lot of farmers are getting letters now from the Rabobank, from, sorry, uh, if these are the plans the government is, is going to, uh, to implement, then your land is worth absolutely zilch. It's a scary collaboration between the government and the banks and, and other entities. I'm uh, Rip Gesellmaker. I uh, am a science journalist who investigated on this uh, government scheme of buying up farmland in the name of nature protection for like 10 or 15 years and so I discovered how uh, which uh, interests are behind this whole scheme. I used to be a real uh, greenie, a conservationist, but I turned more into a supporter of the fishermen and the farmers because I saw what interests are now also behind so-called conservation. I studied the role of the NGOs, uh, especially here in uh, Holland. Who are these NGOs? If you move in closer, you see that who's their largest funder? The government. 
So actually, it's not NGOs like non-governmental organizations, but they are governmental extensions. I do the same as the uh, uh, nature organizations do in Holland. Why? Need to go my cows? Why? My farm need to close? After that, there are coming some other cows back in this area. Not from a farmer, but from a, a nature organization. And they need to eat the grass. So what's the difference? I think it's very strange that uh, a farmer is not allowed to do it. And a nature organization uh, can do the same um, as I do. Um, and, they have no, and then there is no nitrogen problem. But what do these NGOs do for these people? They make a political issue constantly of something that is only in the interest of the, the 1%. They use NGOs, they pump them full with money to promote policies that, well, 99% of the population does not care anything about. All subsidies to NGOs need, need to end. There's this uh, notation of the government that they want to convert another 150,000 hectares of farmland. They will use 25 billion euros of taxpayers' money to buy up farmland again under the flag of nitrogen. Yeah, we've got a nitrogen fund, which is uh, 25 billion. And we've got a nature fund, which is 35 billion euros. How is that going to be spent? Or? Well, it's going to be spent by uh, buying out farmers who want to stop by helping them with uh, technical aids, so you can have innovations to reduce ammonia emission, um, uh, but also to uh, better uh, care and better manage our nature areas. And now suddenly we're, we're, we're wasting billions and billions on a nightmare. Because of the, the huge amount of animals on a very small surface, um, we have this ammonia problem. And so the, the idea is now that our nature has to be restored due to regulations, we European regulations. The real reason is there are EU regulations. We have to stick to those. Whether we have translated them in the right data is another story. But there are regulations. If we don't do that, we get uh, fines from the EU and we have big problems. Because we made this holy promise to the EU, we now are in the situation where we actually have to hunt down our farmers. Government has to do what the government has to do sometimes, which is painful. Uh, but there is also 25 billion euro for a small country as the Netherlands uh -huh. to help farmers to get a better life, to help nature. Factory workers, 25,000 of them, are enlisted as enforcers. They're given a pistol and a crash course in the forcible collectivization of farms. Stalin's mouthpiece, Lazar Kaganovich, exhorts these so-called 25,000ers, setting their goal at 100% collectivization. They had a law that stated that 49% of the nitrogen emissions should be reduced by farmers, but uh, our parliament hasn't even decided on this yet, but they actually increased that number up to 75%. This law isn't even, even democratic. Nobody in the last elections voted for this. It's, it's been clear for a couple of years that the government wants to reduce nitrogen emissions and especially wants farmers to step in uh, in, in producing it and uh, not the industry. If you have the, the building activity, you're also producing nitrogen. There you see uh, two pipes. Those two pipes are from brick fabrics. We need the brick, uh, the brick uh, fabric, because we want to build some houses. When you need to reduce nitrogen, and you say we need to reduce nitrogen a lot, uh -huh. you must look where can we reduce nitrogen. When you build a new house, you need bricks. The purpose of the, the measures that are, yeah, the legislation they are trying to push on us now, is they, they are using the narrative to cut down uh, emissions, but actually they want our soils, they want our land, 
lots of people love eating beef, but it also has the biggest environmental impact of nearly any food we eat. I don't know if you've ever seen a cow up close, but they're massive. It takes a lot of cow food to make that much cow. And a lot of land to make all that cow food. More than a quarter of all land on Earth is devoted to feeding those cows. Nobody knows how to get rid of no one that. how to get cows to stop farting. Exactly. Cows burp and fart. A lot. And it's impacting climate change. It's what we have to do, which is zero. If it was a 50% reduction, then you could ignore, okay, leave the cows alone. We're trying to avoid the temperature continuing to go up. You do need to go to zero. Otherwise, you're, you're continuing to have temperature increase. Bill Gates has been secretly buying up all the farmland across America and is now the largest farmland owner in the United States. In 2020, Bill Gates made headlines for becoming the largest private farmland owner in the U.S. The farmers are targeted, and why are the farmers targeted? Because they have land. Uh, they need to build houses, they need to build factories, they, they have to build highways and that they need therefore the farmers, uh, farmers' lands and they want to get it as cheap as possible. We need one million houses. To solve this problem, the, the state needs land and what is easier than to kick out our farmers? Agricultural food giant Cargill plans to start selling wearable devices designed to curb methane emissions from cattle. The koeien die dragen een deel bij aan de uitstoot, maar hoe kunnen we dat reduceren? Onder andere hebben we het dan over de ammoniakuitstoot. Er zijn ontzettend veel bedrijven bezig met de vloer, met luchtwassers, etc. Raakt en op die manier als je deze zenuwbaan op deze manier raakt, dan gaat de koe spontaan plassen. Dan krijgt hij een zenuwreflex waarmee hij een plasneiging krijgt en onmiddellijk zijn plasje gaat doen. We hebben vanuit Hanskamp een unieke koetoilet ontwikkeld. I mean, we have a problem and we have to solve it. There are a lot of solutions for uh, um, um, uh, reduce nitrogen. If we change the food for the cows and the chickens, for example, and also for the pigs, but it's a little bit different story, then we can easily bring down the amount of ammonia that they are producing back with 30, maybe even 40 percent. So what we need is innovative farming, uh, and not immediately saying we can't do it. Yes, we can. Some of the farmers have even said, okay, if, if nitrogen is the problem, if nature is the problem, then I will get rid of my cattle, but you will not get my land. And the, the state has said, no, 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 <laughs> that's not the point. We want your land. Farmers are in, in their way and uh, they want to get rid of us, but we won't let them. They are really suffering. They're really um, feeling like they have absolutely no other option anymore. I believe six farmers have actually hanged themselves because of this new policy. What I'm hoping to see is that more you know, Dutch civilians, um, also from the cities, will, will join in on their actions and protests so they don't, they don't need to do it by themselves. Every day you, you read in a newspaper that some media is trying to say, um, mainly the governmental media, is trying to say that we are losing the support of, uh, of the people. And I think if you go into the center of Amsterdam and uh, you see the people that only read the propaganda that is produced by the government, yeah, then they, they, they have nothing to do with farmers because they, they buy their food in the shop and that's it. So they have no binding with farms. But if you ask the rest of the Netherlands that are living in rural areas, they, have, uh, they support farmers very much. You can see that with all the flags upside down, it's a distress call. We turn the Dutch flag upside down. And if you drive through the Netherlands, you can see it everywhere. They wanted to show their distress. So it's, it's like a symbol of distress. Um, and they put them up on lantern posts, they put them outside of their door. I think this is about the people showing each other that they have to, to, to connect and stay together in order to fight this tyranny.
What are the, what is the significance of the upside down flag, sir? It's a uh, it's it's a flag which uh, indicates that there is an emergency situation. It's it's from the uh, the ship uh, the vessel sector. It's okay. from the maritime sector. Uh, that's a better word. Oh, you're supposed to do that if, if the vessels in distress. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's the traditional form of saying uh, there's an emergency. So. Did you, do you think there's a distress or? Maybe there is certainly there's certainly distress, yes. But I guess you guys have different opinions on. We have different opinions. They use false false pretense to 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 um, force their own agendas and force their own ideological ideological ideas. Under under the guise of democracy and liberalism, they are taking away rights, and people so most people are fine with it because they feel this sort of responsibility, maybe because it's so progressive to uh, um, care about the climate. So they're willing to actually sacrifice their own well-being. Even well-educated people very often don't, don't actually have the common sense to, um, well, to, to, to sit down and, and, and relax and think, well, this, what this government official, what this minister is saying, is it true? Well, very often, no, it's not true. Our Minister of Climate, he has said in a TV show, he has said nitrogen is like a toxic blanket that, that is covering nature and, and, and that makes it impossible for plants to grow. That, that is not a scientific explanation of nitrogen. It's all made up to create a, an atmosphere of fear. And, uh, and then once the, the people are, are frightened, you can do whatever you want with them. Many people, the masses, I would say, li like to be told what to do in order to be safe. So we have, we've paid a really, really high price for this because we, we gave up all our freedoms to feel safe. And obviously this safety is also very um, fake because it's, you can't be safe without being free. It's not about saving the planet, it's about government control because that's in effect what is happening. Our basic values were all built around the fact that an individual determines his or her own life and is responsible for his or her own children and his wife and his house. And you determine your own life, whether you die or live, you determine that yourself. And the transition that we're making is from this freedom of the individual to a collectivistic or Marxistic or communistic or socialistic sort of structure. We're sleeping and we're in this transition, we're in this silent revolution, and I think it's very scary. In de stikstofplannen staat dat er in 2030 veel minder stikstof in Nederland mag zijn. Te veel stikstof is niet goed voor de natuur. Die stikstofuitstoot die moet omlaag, die moet flink omlaag. Misschien moeten sommige boeren hun bedrijf opgeven, maar veel meer boeren moeten hun bedrijf veranderen. Uh, natuurvriendelijker maken. A lot of farmers, but also just Dutch citizens, are realizing that this nitrogen crisis or the climate crisis in general is based on fraudulent models. Stikstof is er in meerdere verbindingen en ammoniak is er daar een van. Nou, er komt vooral heel veel ammoniak vrij door de landbouw, door de mest van dieren. Die wordt verspreid in de lucht en slaat vervolgens weer in de natuur neer. De natuur heeft onder andere last van de neerslag van stikstof. The, the people who really know something about it, the, the, the professors in, in this field, they said, well, scrap the model. The, the model is, sh should be out of the window as fast as possible. So this is my office. I've done a lot of work on the North Sea, over there. I've worked on the Antarctic, and there you see me with the king and queen, although they were prince and princess at that time. So, uh, and there you see me with the former queen, getting a medal of honor and what for is arts, your, arts and science. And what is your specialty? I'm a marine ecologist. Okay. So marine ecologist, so studying the system as a whole. And my main thing is uh, humans and the sea. When I retired, I became a member of a Dutch polit political party. And uh, well, I started on working on the nitrogen there, and I said, "Okay, this is uh, the data are not right, and we should do something." And besides that, I think that you're overdoing uh, the damage that nitrogen is doing to nature. There is a problem, 
but it's not as bad as you are claiming all the time. The idea of these people is there is a problem everywhere, so we have to solve it everywhere. And there is this holy belief that if you release uh, these nitrogen compounds at a certain spot, it will go across the whole country. But that's not true. And, uh, and so then you have a, yeah, a different view, and then there is a model, so they have built a model, which is rather shaky. They state that the nitrogen model is not suited to calculate the things you would like to calculate with. You can use it for analyzing where the problems might be and as a scientific tool to understand the processes better, but it's absolutely not capable of calculating the data on which to base your measurements against the farmers. It's bullshit. A few other people, besides myself, I have written a chapter in here that this model is not suited for the calculations they are doing. And that the data, uh, even in some spots, have a variation of 95%. And then you use those data to tell a farmer that he has to disappear. And that's something where I think this is not the way to approach this. If the outcome of a model coincides with what I see there out in the field, that's coincidence, because the next year it will be completely different. Why do we even use the models then? Because it gives us the, uh, the knowledge on the different ways the system can develop. So basically what it can show us is how do processes work. It, these, these models are very well suited to test theories. If you put crap in, you get crap out. <laughs> yeah, that's something that we have said. There are already big question marks. And the major issue is that you, are, the government, is believing the data that come out of the model and is using those data to make the policy, including getting rid of the farmers. We are actually discussing, you know, uh, waving goodbye to our farmers. I think this is a really, really sad and worrisome time. I mean, these are hard-working people, they're paying taxes, they've worked their land for sometimes 10, 15 generations. And now everything seems to have changed. The farmers are bad, they're producing uh, waste, uh, they're, they're killing our nature, uh, uh, they're treating their animals badly, and, and suddenly they have to disappear. 20 years ago, you would not have dreamt that this would have happened. We were proud of our farmers. The Dutch farmers were the best in the world, and, and they still are. I believe it's very important that uh, people like journalists uh, look into all sides of the story. And not all of the Dutch journalists tell the right story or tell the total story. They're just cherry picking and because they are cherry picking one part of the, uh, of the story, uh, the people in Holland do get a wrong uh, image of what is going on. It's absolutely insane that we would actually sacrifice the knowledge of our Dutch farmers. They are, they are one of the best in the, in the whole world. When governments are going to buy out farmers from their fields, from their, uh, where they live, uh, they're never going, going to come back. And therefore, they're making a big mistake. And I will think that in maybe 10 years or so, uh, a politician will say what happened in 2022, uh, why are all farmers uh, gone and uh, nature hasn't changed. We get rid of this uh, if we only have uh, our famous good quality cows on pictures, um, we will break down the backbone of our country and eventually everybody will get hungry and go bankrupt. We also want to change the economy so that farmers can uh, earn a better income with less animals. Meat is too much too cheap. The policy would ra raise the price of meat and, and milk. And Probably. By 2050, there will be 10 billion human mouths to feed. So will farming and eating insects help solve one of the 21st century's biggest challenges? I am here to reveal my hidden talent. Eating micro livestock, corn worms, they're still alive. So here we go. Have some meat worms. 
I'm telling you, I'd win Survivor. It's not about nature protection. Only the ones who, in this process, have acquired the, the most money will have uh, the ruling power. It comes down to control of resources in the hands of the few. Look at the power of the NGOs. Who, who do they really support? Who's pumping money into them? It's always government and billionaires doing it. En de minister die schreef vandaag dat ze een verkenning heeft gedaan naar mogelijke maatregelen voor Natura 2000 gebieden. Daar staat namelijk in dat zij een vertrouwelijke vraag hebben gehad vanuit LNV om in het kader van het transitiefonds landelijk gebied een quick scan te maken van kansen en herstel. So this is the relation between the government and NGOs. To, a, to an extent you can sell the public, uh, you can buy the public opinion by these NGOs. And this is what really happens in Holland, but also in the US. Well, we've now seen Brussels approving these plans for the Dutch government to forcibly buy out livestock farms to cut nitrogen emissions. But get this, as part of the deal, the farmers would not be able to ever farm anywhere in the EU again. It begins with speaking out and organizing and reaching out maybe even to you know people in other countries and because there, we, it, it, it isn't a Dutch issue, it's a, it's a global issue. Canada is now apparently going down the same route. The Canadian government under Justin Trudeau, well now he wants to impose drastic climate change restrictions again on farmers, in, again using the nitrogen excuse to crack down on food production. You know, this just seems like complete insanity to me. No less than the future of Irish farming is on the line. The move towards cutting emissions by 51%. There's a lot of politicians out there, you know, talking about carbon targets uh, and that there'll be no compulsory cull, but we don't see that happening. We see them culling through the back door, uh, be it through the nitrates regulation. I don't know how we got politicized when it comes to two of the most important things you have to have for prosperity. You got to have food and you got to have energy. Nobody disputes that. And yet they become, you know, very partisan issues. We are in the grip of a, a, a common psychosis, which is uh, expressing itself primarily in we want to turn against everything that makes civilized life possible. Agriculture contributes about 33% of all the emissions of the world. We can't get to net zero. We don't get this job done unless agriculture is front and center as part of the solution. There is a dire warning tonight about a greenhouse gas called nitrous oxide. It has hundreds of times more warming power in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. It comes from the nitrogen in agricultural fertilizer, which is used around the world to increase crop yields. UN experts concluded the world needs to cut the amount of nitrogen emissions in half to avoid disastrous consequences. It's all about fear. It's about uh, uh, making people fear for the future so that they would uh, agree with policies that they, in, uh, if they are uh, sober they would never agree with. In the Western world we are increasingly at war with everything that makes modern life possible, right? It's farmers in the Netherlands, it's uh, cows in Ireland, it's mining in Great Britain, it's nuclear power in Germany. This is part of a bigger picture. We're kind of under the guise of the climate movement that the green movement, pretty much everything that makes modern life possible is under attack. But instead of trying to fight back as a unified front, kind of we are split up in kind of these, these you know, smaller battle groups that never unify to take on the broader ideological issue that I believe would have significant appeal all over the West if we could find a way to frame it in exactly this kind of way. Uh, we will protect our farmers to every extent and we will do it on every level, on a European scale, on a worldwide scale. I will protect farming, I will protect uh, our free living because I want to give my children the same free li life that, they had, that I had. And, um, if we let this happen to our Dutch farmers, the next thing will happen to the civilians. Uh, they will take their houses, they will, uh, they will decide about uh, where you can live, how you can live, and how you should live your life. And this is very dangerous and I want, don't want a, a country like that and I don't want a world like that, so I fight for this. For the remaining farmers, anything is preferable to what they have witnessed. Many volunteer for the collectives. 
surrendering cattle and implements, home and land to the state. Stalin himself conceives the scheme of subsidizing collective startup costs with the worldly goods of new members.